Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Thank you very much um, for joining us. Next, we are going to hear a presentation on genetics and limb girdle muscular dystrophy with Dr. Matthew Wicklin. I just also wanted to remind everybody, too, if you um, want to still continue to use the chat feature, please make sure you are replying to all panelists and attendees. That way, all of the attendees can see your chats. So it's wonderful. So many of you are communicating that way. So I want to introduce Dr. Wickland. Um, he is a professor of neurology and director of the neuromuscular section at the University of Colorado School of Medicine in Aurora, Colorado. He's also the clinical director of the MDA Care Center. His major research interest involves genetic muscle diseases. He is the author or co-author of more than 130 published articles, chapters and abstracts and lectures at national meetings. Is currently the primary investigator or site investigator on five clinical trials related to limb girdle muscular dystrophies, FSHD, and inclusion myositis. Dr. Wicklin, I'll turn it over to you if you could share your screen. Uh, let me see if I can find that screen sharing. All right, you can see me. Let me see if I can share the screen here. We're going to go with this one and see how this looks. <laughs> okay. We see it's starting. There we go. Perfect. All right. Well, it's a pleasure. Oh, go ahead. All right. It's, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be with you all and uh, in uh, this time of virtual presentations. Uh, and I'll say good afternoon to those of you, of you in the Eastern time zone. and. For everybody else farther west, uh, like me, uh, still good morning to you all. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the limb girdle muscular dystrophies, and then uh, we're going to go into genetics to hopefully better understand genetics. So here we go. Hopefully. All right, there we go. So first part just has to do with the uh, limb girdle muscular dystrophies. And back in 1953, quite some time ago, pretty much there were three muscular dystrophies that were the most common. And these two gentlemen out in uh, Newcastle in England decided that there were others. And so they designated those as the limb girdle muscular dystrophies. So they wanted to separate those from the ones that we did know, which were this, which is Duchenne muscular dystrophy, this, which is myotonic dystrophy, and this, which is fascio-scapulohumeral muscular dystrophy. Um, this has actually all the cardinal features with the overriding scapula, protuberant abdomen, etc. And interestingly, there are still patients that are called limb girdle dystrophy that have these three other types of muscular dystrophies. If you're undiagnosed, then you need to be checked for those. So limb girdle weakness. We have a new definition which is called postnatal onset of progressive weakness and muscle atrophy affecting the proximal muscles of the lower and the upper extremities. And as I said, the limb girdle dystrophies are really, uh, it was a catch-all that included proximal weakness that was not something else, which included other muscular dystrophies, inflammatory myopathies, myotonic dystrophies, congenital myopathies, etc. It is important to remember that there's been an explosion in the uh, genetics associated with the limb girdle dystrophies and the first gene was 1991, in which it was discovered. By the year 2000, there were 18 different genetic subtypes. And the five pictures below are just all different young adults that have a limb girdle muscular dystrophy. They have five different phenotype or five different genetic subtypes, but they all look roughly the same. And now in 2020, um, there's just an explosion because I, there are at least 120 different genes that can present with a limb girdle phenotype 
that are a muscle disease. And it's also important to remember that in this cartoon, if you look at the bottom right of the screen, it's the nucleus. And then a little bit above that, it's within the cell, so intracellular. Then there's the sarcolemma, which is the uh, muscle membrane. Then there's the extracellular space, and then the extracellular matrix. And the whole point of this cartoon, this, this slide, is that if you affect a protein, so a gene that would affect a protein anywhere in a muscle fiber, you're, or if it's near a muscle fiber, such as the extracellular matrix, you can wind up having weakness, which is in a limb girdle pattern, and have a limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So there is a slight change that's occurred in terms of how we're talking about the limb girdle dystrophies. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, and we'll talk about sort of the brand new definition, which really is not much different, but it further defines how we on the research side are thinking about the limb girdle dystrophies. So in the old way of naming the limb girdle dystrophies, you'll see that first you had a number, which was one for dominant, two for recessive, and then there was a letter designation added on, and that was the order in which a gene was discovered. So for example, LGMD2A was calpanopathy. That was the first that was discovered. And the challenge is we got all the way to LGMD2Z, which was the 26th discovered. And this was the challenge is that we kept discovering more genes. And so the question was, if you run out of the alphabet, what do you do next? So I'm gonna briefly talk about in 2017, our European colleagues met and they had a consensus meeting. And at that consensus meeting, they wanted to put together a better definition of what are the limb girdle dystrophies and then how should they be named. And so they came up with the following criteria. So a limb girdle muscular dystrophy has to be in genetically inherited, progressive, have predominantly proximal muscle weakness at presentation and be described in at least two unrelated families. And that was important because there were starting to be publications of single families for a particular gene. And that was, there were no other families that had been described. And so they just wanted it to be more than just a single family member in a single gene. And then it also says that affected individuals must achieve independent walking at some point in their life, and that was to distinguish them from some of the congenital muscular dystrophies and congenital myopathies, have an elevated muscle enzyme level, have degenerative changes on muscle imaging, so MRI or CT or ultrasound over the course of disease, and then have at some point in the disease, it dystrophic changes on muscle biopsy, ultimately leading to end-stage disease. So in terms of the nomenclature, how do we talk about the LGMDs? The new criteria that was proposed was to have R for recessive and D for dominant. And then the order in which the gene was discovered was given a number. And the advantage of the new criteria, the new nomenclature, is that we're not going to run out of numbers because those are infinite. And so, uh, there's been this change, as you see on the bottom right, from the older nomenclature, such as LGMD2A, which was for calpanopathies, and now that would become LGMD-R1, so it was the first recessively, and then calpane 3 related. And then another example would be Bethlehem myopathies, which previously did not have an LGMD designation, and they are a dominantly inherited, can be recessive, but mostly dominantly, and they've become LGMD D5, collagen 6 related. And so this is the proposed new nomenclature for the LGMDs. Uh, on the US side, the one challenge we had with it is there were a number of the autosomal dominantly inherited limb girdle muscular dystrophies, and I already heard in the question and answers, such as uh, 1B that were not included. Um, 
most of us on this side of the pond, we just believe that if you have a limb girdle dystrophy, you have a limb girdle dystrophy and it matters less so what we call it because they're all genetic disorders for which we're gonna hopefully have treatments over the next, I'll say three to 30 years. How's that? Depending on which subtype you have. All right, so the main purpose of this talk is to try to help people have a little better understanding of the genetics that underlie the limb girdle dystrophies. And that's important because ultimately the treatment will be genetic. Uh, and then ultimately to get that genetic treatment, you'll have to have a genetic diagnosis and that genetic diagnosis will need to be confirmed. So I didn't give disclosures for my talk, but I do have a disclosure for this part. And so it says here, except for trauma, it is fair to say that virtually every human illness has a hereditary component. And I'm going to say, I approve this message because I believe that's true. You can even make an argument that some aspects of trauma, such as people's risk aversion or risk taking desires uh, probably are genetically wired. And so maybe some trauma is also genetic. So there has been a huge advance. So the person that, let me go back just for a moment, that said that was Francis Collins. And Francis Collins was involved in uh, the delineating the genome. And so this is a Time Magazine 2000, where it's talking about cracking the code, which was the Human Genome Project. And you will see that over the ensuing years, time has kept up with genetics to this point right here, which is the future is now, because as you're probably aware, there are gene therapies in development for the limb girdle dystrophies, and there are eight genetically based therapies for neuromuscular disorders already available. So we're moving there. Now, this is most people's reaction to genetics, which is, oh my gosh. And then you may also have this other challenge, which is, this is the way a lot of care providers um, deal with genetics, which is, hey, I don't know, it does, it's, it's kind of hard to understand. So we're gonna take it from the beginning and try to move forward. And I do have to give credit to Livia Medney, um, who is part of the, personalized medicine program at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia for many of these slides because she does a, a brilliant job of presenting the genetics. So the goal of uh, genetics is to lower the bar to access genetic testing, and that's been happening, and you'll see that. And the me main reason for that is that genetic testing really is becoming increasingly more complex, yet as it becomes more complex, it's being used um, on an individual basis much more rapidly than in the past. So interestingly, a lot of genetics is being outstripped by the technology. And so the technology has occurred and then we have to figure out how we're best going to use that. So simple part of genetics. It's, it's really straightforward. You start with DNA, which can reproduce itself when cells divide. And then DNA is transcribed into RNA. And then RNA is transferred outside of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And then in ribosomes, it's translated into proteins. So pretty much this is genetics. DNA goes to RNA, goes to protein. And in bodies, we use those proteins as building blocks for making cells and then cells go on to become organs and organs become humans or other creatures. So an LGMD gene turns to LGMD RNA and then we get an LGMD protein. So again, LGMD gene and then just in a visual mode becomes an LGMD protein. Again, looking at it from the top right, you can see there's a cell and cells even farther to the right, you could 
put a human body up there. So humans are composed of organs which have cells. And in the cells, there's a nucleus. And in the nucleus, there are chromosomes. And then if you unravel those chromosomes, you get down into genes. And then genes are composed of these building blocks of DNA called nucleotides. And you can see those nucleotides in the letters on the bottom right portion there, which are T A G C. So once again, when you do this under the microscope, you can see cells that are dividing. And then you can take and expand those out and you can see that there are chromosomes. Females have 46 chromosomes two of which are X chromosomes, and males have 46 chromosomes, but one is an X and one is a Y, and you can see that on the bottom right there. So going back to this main pathway from the cell to the nucleus to the chromosomes, chromosomes are made up of genes, and genes are composed of individual nucleotides that are paired, you can see, just as I said, that there are these base pairs. And so for every strand, half strand of DNA, there's another half that's connected to it. And adenine always associates with thymine and guanine with cytosine. So when you get down from the cell to the nucleus, and then from the nucleus to the chromosomes, and then from the chromosomes down into the genes, genes have their own particular structure also. And so they're all composed of these small building blocks of DNA, but they're organized in a fashion in which you have at the left part of the screen a, what's called a promoter, and that will help activate a gene. And that becomes important for gene therapy because depending on the promoter that you use, you can activate a gene in different tissues specifically, whether it be muscle, whether it be heart, whether it be kidney, et cetera. So promoters, then there are exons, and then there are these things called introns, which get cut out from exons. So the exons are what go on to become the reading material that becomes the RNA, which then becomes protein, the introns are DNA that are actually removed, and that's important for a number of reasons. Introns are probably involved in regulatory functions uh, in terms of how well the uh, gene is expressed, but they're also probably important for helping with, over generations, developing changes in DNA, which can be sometimes deleterious, but sometimes beneficial. And again, on the right, you can see at the top, you have a large extent of DNA, and then you cut out intron one, intron two, intron three, and then you're left with a much smaller RNA through splicing, and then that RNA then moves outside of the nucleus into the cytoplasm and becomes protein when it runs through the ribosome and you create protein. There are reading rules for DNA. And so if you have DNA, then every three base pairs becomes a single amino acid when it ultimately goes from DNA to RNA and then out to protein. And so it's important to think about three nucleotides in a row being very important. And those three nucleotides in a row, as you can see on that little table, there is a first base pair on the left vertical column, a second base pair in the upper portion of that table, and then on the right, there's a third base pair. And depending on what that sequence is, so for example, in the upper left, it becomes U, U, and U, and U, U, U becomes an amino acid, which is phenylalanine. If you then look, it's important to see that there are three of these that are in red, highlighted in red. So it's UAA, UAG, and UGA. 
And those are what are called stop codons. And that's important because you have to know when to start and when to stop producing a protein. And without a stop codon, you would have one incredibly long protein that had no value. The disadvantage of stop, pro, uh, stop codons is that if they're inadvertently put somewhere, then they will stop production of a protein prematurely. So this is an example of taking three of those bases in a row and putting it into a English version. And so Victoria Gemmell wrote this phrase, the cat ate the mat and the man got mad. All day his cat ate and ate. He'd fed him too, but the cat was fat. And the man did ask the vet, but the vet got mad and the man got sad and let the cat eat his new mat. So all of these are groups of three letters and they become a word. So each three letters becomes a word just as three bases become a, an amino acid. So as we look at what can happen in terms of genetics and in terms of mutations, or in this case, we'll call them pathogenic variants, you can see that the following could happen. So the phrase was, the cat ate the mat and the man got mad. And that makes sense. The man would get mad if his cat ate his mat. If you then had a change in one of the nucleotides such that it became the bat ate the mat and the man got mad, that may, might make a little bit of sense because a flying bat could potentially eat a mat and the man could get mad at the bat that ate the mat. So, some changes can be less deleterious than others. And so potentially, if you changed cat to bat, it would have mostly the same meaning. Um, and the protein, which is this whole sentence, might not work quite as well, but you get the idea that an animal ate the mat and the man got mad. Now you could have a different genetic change, such as an H instead of the C. And then all of a sudden, the hat ate the mat and the man got mad. And in most worlds, a hat cannot eat a mat. A hat is an inanimate object. And so therefore, this does not make sense. And all of a sudden you may have a protein, or in this case, a long sentence, that just doesn't make as much sense and it may not work as well. And so that would make this more likely a pathogenic variant. And then we have one other thing that can happen. Instead of substituting a letter or substituting a base, you can actually have one that's deleted. And then what actually happens is you get a shift in the reading frame. And so instead of it saying the at, ate the mat, et cetera, what happens is everything shifts by one letter and then your sentence sounds as follows. The ata, tet, hem, ata, nd, hem, ang, atom, and it makes no sense at all. And this definitely is a pathogenic variant because that protein now is misshapen or misformed and doesn't work correctly. So this is that reading rule where every three bases becomes an amino acid. And if you change one of the initial bases, you can change an amino acid and that amino acid can have various effects on the ultimate protein structure. So we're gonna talk about types of DNA alterations. We can start very big. They're what are called copy number alterations. And if you look at the chromosome level, here are those 46 chromosomes again. But here, there was a copy number where there was an extra chromosome. So what happens is that there are three chromosome 21s. There should only be two. And so this is trisomy 21, which is also Down syndrome. So this, if you have too much or too little of a of DNA, meaning an entire chromosome that is either duplicated or deleted, that can lead to significant disease. You can have it on a smaller basis. This is just a readout of a portion of a chromosome, and it's just missing a portion on the left of that image where it's circled in red, and what you can see is there's less of the uh, chromosome in that area, so it's a smaller deletion. And then if you look at the green, that actually shows where it has an extra 
amount. So that's a duplication there. And depending on how much is duplicated or deleted, you can have, and where that is in a chromosome, you can develop disease also. So there are DNA sequence changes, and we talked a little bit about those. So firstly, if this is what it should look like, this is what the order should be, which is T, G, G, T, G, 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 A, C, A, T, you can have a single change where you have a mutation, which is a substitution, and now you have T, G, G, T, G, A on one copy and G on the other copy, and so you would have a single base pair substitution. And then you can also have what we talked about earlier, which is you can actually delete one. And so now it's TG, and then you get CC, and then it's got a TGGG because you lost one of the Cs, and so you, uh, sorry, you, you've lost one of the Ts, and therefore you've shifted the whole reading frame. And so from the midpoint roughly of that on, there's a change in all of the amino acids that come out. So at the chromosome level, this is how you would read that things would be written. So that first example, it says 47 XX, so that means female, and then plus 21 would mean that there's an extra chromosome 21, which is Down syndrome. And then you can see other ones where you have 45 chromosomes, which is one fewer. You have 48 chromosomes, which is too many. And then you have more complex deletions or duplications at the chromosome level. At the DNA level, when you describe a change for a gene, it's as follows. First, you talk about the DNA, the coding DNA location for a gene. And so in a gene, sorry, might read C8801 and then G greater than sign A. That means that there was a change from a G at that position, the 8,801st nucleotide position to an A. And then you can also describe the sequence change at the protein level, which can either be that you have a change where the amino acid changes, so it's P dot arginine at the amino acid position, 2934, and that turns into histidine. Or you can have a change, the next one down, P dot GLY24, which means that it's a nonsense change, which leads to a stop codon. Or you can have a change where it's P dot LEU54, and then it either will say an equal sign or LEU, which is called a silent change, which is relevant in the splice site region where the introns and exons uh, connect. And changes in those that are silent sometimes can cause disease if they're in that splice site. So this is just a harpist. And they're simply playing the music of life in the key of DNA, because all life stems from DNA. And so we're going to talk a little bit about inheritance patterns of gene mutations. So dominant mutations, you have a single mutation it causes a genetic condition. And so it just takes one of the two copies and then somebody will be affected with disease. In recessive, if you have two mutations, you will develop the inherited condition, the medical condition. But if you have a single mutation, you become an unaffected carrier in most cases, unaffected. So recessive, a single copy, you have, you're the same as everybody else, but if you have two copies, you have disease. This is an example of that. So on the left is one parent, and on the top is another parent. So on the left is an unaffected parent, and on the right, or I'm sorry, the top is an affected parent. And what that tells you is when you look at if they have children, that roughly 50% of the children would develop the dominantly inherited disease. But there is the other 50% that would not develop it because they would not get the abnormal copy from the uh, affected member. Interestingly, you can also have 
a mutation that occurs spontaneously, so it arises what we call de novo, where neither parent is affected, but then you then develop a child that has disease, and the child has disease because there was a change in the parent, usually in the germline, either in the mother's eggs or in the father's sperm, that that's where the change occurred. And so the person throughout their body, the parent was unaffected, but there were mutations either in the sperm or in the egg. And so therefore you can develop a person that has a child that has disease, even though neither parent is affected in a dominant disorder. Here's an example of a young girl that has a limb girdle muscular dystrophy. She kind of waddles as she walks more than you would expect. And then she's doing her best to run back to her mother. Interestingly, her mother is also affected, but less severely. And then you can see her going up steps. And so you can see that she's weak going up steps. She uses her hand to help push herself up the step and the railing. So this can be diagnosed with muscle biopsy. In this case, it's uh, a patient who has RYR1, which many of us consider to be a limb girdle muscular dystrophy because it presents as such. And in this case, with this young lady, mom was mildly affected. I'm sorry, mom was mildly affected, dad was not affected, and so the daughter was affected. And sometimes there can be preferential uh, effects in one generation compared to another. And to me, the easiest way to think about that is a single mutation or a single gene will be pre uh, present in the company of the other 20 some thousand genes and those other 20 some thousand genes mitigate or modulate how severe the disease will be in the affected member. Let's talk about autosomal recessive inheritance. In this case, if both parents are carriers of a recessive disorder, then 25% of the children will not inherit any of the mutations and they will be completely unaffected. 50% will carry one copy and they will be just like their parents and theoretically unaffected. But one quarter on average, 25% will be affected because they will get both abnormal copies and will have a recessive disease. For an individual with recessive mutations, recurrence risk depends on the partner. So if somebody has a recessive disorder, a limb girdle muscular dystrophy type two or R, that person on the top has two pathogenic variants and their partner, if their partner has no pathogenic variants, then none of the children will develop disease and the children will all be carriers. If the partner is a carrier, then there is a 50% chance that the children will have disease and 50% chance that the children will be carriers. So here's an example of a family where there's an affected child in a recessive disorder. Interestingly, mom has this known LGMD mutation. Dad has also a known LGMD mutation, which is pathogenic. It's a null allele, which means it produces no protein. Both mom and dad are carriers, but when they both pass that copy of the affected allele, then the youngster has both copies of the affected allele and therefore has a recessive limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Interestingly, you can also have an affected child, and this could be the example. So a mom has very mild weakness, and that's because some of our recessive limb girdle muscular dystrophies can have mild involvement in those that carry them. So this is a typical calpain 3 pattern on muscle biopsy in this patient, and they have a mild dominant mutation. And then the unaffected 
father may have a germline, spontaneous de novo mutation, and then all of a sudden the child would not have the equivalent of mom's mild disease, but would have a more early onset, more aggressive limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So in conclusion, different LGMD mutations can act in a dominant pattern, and others will act in a recessive manner. It's important to remember that some LGMD gene mutations can cause both a recessive and a dominant pattern of disease. And so examples of that are calpanopathies, dysferlinopathies, titanopathies, desmenopathies, and certainly the collagen six disorders. So I'm gonna just briefly end by talking about recommendations related to diagnosis. So there's pretty good evidence that single gene testing is not the route to go. You need to do at least a panel or an exome. Panels have a slight advantage in that they can be sort of tweaked to be more effective uh, than uh, an exome can be. Interestingly, genome we thought was going to be perfect, but it is only yielding somewhere between 50 to 70% diagnosis. It's also really important to remember that um, the cost of genetic testing is dropping precipitously. So the first genome cost, that was the Human Genome Project. It took 10 years and it cost somewhere between one to $3 billion. In 2007, a Russian oligarch paid $8 million and it took nine months for him to have the first personalized genome processed. Currently, it's about $400 to run to get a genome, and then it's about $1,500 with the bioinformatics. Of course, it's gonna cost a little more through a company, but that's sort of what we're dealing with. And then NovaSeq technology is going to give us the one hour, $100 genome in the next year. So a final couple things, what if genetic testing is negative or equivocal? We're finding that some people actually have acquired disorders that have been slowly progressive. That's important. Sometimes you need to do further genetics because maybe the gene you're looking for is not in the panel that you had. And we had a young lady recently that had McArdle's disease that was missed on all of her panels and we diagnosed her. You have to make sure that you look at other ways of looking at DNA because certain disorders will not be seen on panels. You should consider genome sequencing. And then sometimes, as has been talked about, you have to evaluate other family members or go to research labs to have them do testing. We had one gentleman recently that had a uh, autosomal dominant disorder with balancing containing protein. And we used his imaging, which is his on the left and the reference on the right to show that that was the same pattern as he had. There are free genetic testing programs. It's important that you know that they're out there. They cover about 100 plus genes that are include almost all the limb girdle genes. And then conclusions are, despite challenges, genetic testing is critically important. It delivers a definitive diagnosis. It delineates other organ system involvement, cardiac or pulmonary. It can provide guidance regarding a patient's prognosis. It allows informed decision-making about family planning. It's imperative for clinical trials because without genetics, you will not be involved in genetic testing trials or genetic treatment trials. And ultimately, genetic testing is going to be guiding our treatment. And so this is the guideline, which is the diagnostic process for LGMDs. Should be broad genetic testing is the first step. And then if that's not positive, then you can circle back to biopsies, other imaging, or other testing, such as RNA sequencing to figure things out. So thank you very much for your time. And I should, I think, stop sharing my screen because they tell me that I should be done. So let's see if I can do that. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wicklin. That was very informative. Um, we have a few questions that came in, and um, a couple are, are around family situations. This person's asking, my brother had a DNA test and uh, was given an LGMD diagnosis. 
my neurologist says no need for me to test as I must have the same type of LG MD. Is that so? The answer to that is probably, but not for sure. Um, if you have free testing, I would do free testing. The main reason for that is um, we've had families that have more than one thing running in the family. Um, certainly the easy way to think about that is in the Amish population. Back in the 50s, we knew that LGMD ran in that population. And what we ultimately figured out is that they had both calpain and sarcoglycanopathy running in that, and yet they were all called LGMD. So genetic testing is the route to go. Okay. Do you know if LGMD1F has any clinical trials available? Um, again, um, I'd have to look that up. Uh, so my answer is I don't, but again, the clinicaltrials.gov or just uh, Google's wonderful these days, uh, clinicaltrials.gov, you, you should be able to find that out. But I don't know of any, right. What happens if when you were diagnosed, there was no genetic inherited gene found, nor no description in at least two early families? How would that person find out their LGM type? So if you have a gene, it sounds like maybe what that would be is that somebody would have a gene that uh, was abnormal that would potentially lead to a limb girdle dystrophy. It would likely be that you would need time for others to be diagnosed, or it would need to be that you would have to have some sort of further testing done on you to show that that was the causative uh, gene for your disorder. Okay. If a child tests negative, would a parent be negative as well? Uh, depends on if it's, so the answer is it depends on uh, what, uh, it depends if it's dominant or not. Um, so the answer is not always. Okay. Well, that answers. We have a couple questions relating around that. Um, is it possible for a mom to have limb girdle 2A and her child have a different subtype? So again, it is possible, but it's unlikely. Um, and the other way to think about that is in a single person, we have what we call double trouble and triple trouble. And so we've had a number of patients now that we do larger genetic testing panels where we find that they're a little bit atypical for what we think their limb girdle phenotype is. And it winds up being that they actually have limb girdle muscular dystrophy plus something else. Okay. okay. Um, we have time for a couple more. Do you suggest that anyone pay to get a gene research done? or would you recommend that they do not do something like that? Well, that's a really good question. Yeah, uh, I think the answer is uh, you probably do not need to pay for that. Usually there will be somebody that's doing research in a particular gene that will be interested in looking into your particular <laughs> genetic uh, pathogen mm -hmm. or your genetic variants. And then the other side of that is once there is a movement towards a gene therapy for a particular gene. Um, our industry partners are very willing to uh, go to large steps to try to help sure that patients get diagnosed. So I don't think you'd need to do that. Okay. Are females being affected the most? Uh, it depends on the disorder, but interestingly, in certain disorders like LGMD2L, females tend to be less affected. So. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Wicklin. That was a great presentation, a lot of information, and uh, it definitely got the chat and uh, a lot of folks talking. So thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day, and thank you. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.